I'm Eve Zimmerman. I'm director of the Newhouse Center. Um, for many of you, uh, Professor Octavio Gonzalez needs no introduction. He's known around Wellesley for his brilliant readings of modernist literature, his interest in teaching pioneering courses such as writing aids from 1981 on, and he's been a most generous collaborator uh, to us at the Newhouse Center. Um, for which I'm very grateful. Professor Gonzalez's first monograph, Misfit Modernism, Queer Forms of Double Exile in the 20th Century Novel, appeared in 2020 from Pennsylvania State's prestigious imprint series, Refiguring Modernism. With its implications for queer theory and its figure of the double exile who haunts modernist literature, Scholars across fields of literary studies, Western and non-Western, will benefit from reading this book. And I include myself in that category. Since the book came out, Professor Gonzalez has been dashing here and there, doing talk and discussion, albeit um, But there's another facet of Professor Gonzalez's work that you may be less familiar with. He's an accomplished published poet whose work has appeared in Lambda's Literary Poetry Spotlight, Anomaly, La Guagua, and the Taboo series at La Casita Grande Salon. Today, he will read from his newest work, Limerence, The Wingless Hour. We're fortunate to have Professor Antonio Araiza Rivera of the Spanish department with us today as well. Professor Araiza Rivera, a scholar of poetry, uh, although of a rather different time, uh, will hopefully, and this is no pressure, Professor Araiza Rivera, possibly be willing to start our discussion today after the reading with a question or a comment. Um, please everyone stay connected at the end. Uh, we'll have a brief uh, period for uh, Q&A. And again, thank you, Professor Gonzalez, uh, for your generosity in uh, adding just yet another duty to the many duties that you have at Wellesley and giving us the benefit of your creative spirit. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eve. Um, I really want to thank you and, um, and Antonio and uh, Lauren for your, um, your efforts and for your generosity. Uh, in engaging with uh, some of my work today. I also want to uh, welcome everyone to this gathering. Um, it's nice to be together, even if it's through screens. Um, so um, I envision this reading, uh, the structure of this reading as a almost like a musical composition. So I'm going to begin with two poems that introduce the theme and serve as the overture. Then I'll develop the theme in the first movement, which is a sonnet sequence or a crown which is a series of poems with interlocked lines that serve as a refrain. After the sonnet sequence, I'll recite an interlude titled Raven, followed by a bridge in the form of a villanelle, another ancient lyric form. I'll then continue developing the theme of limerence and other kinds of passionate love in different free verse forms. And the finale uh, is a surreal poem that is and is not about love. If I get especially bold, I might add a found poem in there, but we'll see. So without further ado, uh, this first poem is called Limerence. And just as an introduction, Limerence is a form of passionate love that borders on obsession. Um, and it's a psychological term that I've been inspired with, uh, inspired by um, as I work on this manuscript. Limerence. I want to know you. I want to love you as I can. I want to be you. I want to see you as I can. I want to leave you. I want to breathe you as I can. I want to taste you. I want to face you as I can. I want to sting you. I want to bling you as I can. I want to heal you. I want to steal you as I can. I want to hold you. I want to scold you as I can. I want to use you. I want to lose you as I can. I want to bind you. I want to find you as I can. Cool. 
This one's called Love Push Number Nine Revisited. And this was a finalist for the Oscar Wilde um, Award, um, which I'm very proud of since it's, uh, it's been a long time since I uh, submitted to a poetry contest. Love Push Number Nine Revisited. Has he called, I ask, and my friend suppresses a laugh. Anoint the memory with the meaning of what isn't forgotten. How you kissed me, ravaging, my mouth unsightly, undiscovered, now brooding on microwave popcorn, or the fleshy gyrations on a porno screen, a pas de deux left suddenly, a hand loosened, a grip unfastened, when alone, these could be mistaken for needs. Watching the replay choreographed in flawless repetition, a pattern to the name you gave to what was really going on, my illusions. Earnest attempts at reading your lips, eating your salty cum, pleading even that the stillness never leave me. And it did, as it always does. And I quell the urge to converge back somehow onto your bed, now that your shoulders are battered with the brutal mathematics of consistency. Reason for me then to retain the memories of a few months and save the plot for another day, another's ways of reading abstract symbols, the language of decay as old as love itself. A bitter gamble, this mundane game, ever refuses to claim a winner. I could go on, you see, forever. Until then, let's rewind to the beginning. All right, so here's uh, this sonnet sequence. And as I mentioned, uh, it's, a, it's a crown, so the lines are interlocking. And you'll see what I mean when I, when I finish. Uh, <laughs> The first one's called Baywatch Apollo. Accidentally, proudly after he's gone. Sweaty neon thighs, saltwater nights wakened to foggy mornings. Tanned 70s beach boy shag, bronze Monterey smile, dirty blonde mustache, amazing how the eye licks meat, confusing appetite for hunger. Was he herald only to the gaudy spring? I, corrugated sentinel, washed by Union Square skies, warding December games, playing hopscotch on rainbowed sidewalks, bland office mates under fluorescent night, fluorescent light, hips locked after hours in the dark. Sun King, disassembled, son of man, shaving cream, scars on my back where my wings used to be. The wingless hour. Scars on my back where my wings used to be. Sometimes I still get goosebumps thinking of him, nourished with what I was consumed by. Smudged ring, yellow shit, warm marble tongue licking a wet garden, musky with rosemary and thyme. Hello and goodbye to the boy man in matching parachute pants, onion paper bags under his eyes, clammy hand in a bed of seashells, empty with me in it. Strobe lights throbbed in a hazy maze under the skin. So I began to sing. Warbled blue notes meant for him to hear, ringed lips smoking, what could tranquilize, restore. Eucharist. Lips smoking, what could tranquilize, restore, ghosting silent gestures. Yellow lines, green ink, folded over, opened as a Christmas gift, a new you with complicated hands embracing my cold feet, which you swore to keep warm forever. 
what a story. My telenovela, red carpet star. Fountain of piss in a dim St. Mark's Place motel, drinking rum rain that stained the floor. But the taste, another word for love, was not candied sweet, was no Eucharist. My ex foretold the scene and perceived the rest, glared at the soles of his feet, summoning the beat to move on. Our tangle just began. Magical thinking. Moving to the beat, our tango just began. My own private Idaho Bronco ride under Mormon white cotton sheets, which soon, which soon reddened and bloomed, sprung loose like a baby's tooth. In Spanish, we say milky, twisting it back and forth, side to side, because it hurts so good. Because it's time, you say, but you didn't say. You come out swinging, lip syncing, while I dance in a darkened hall, only to ride shotgun at dawn. Green sweat cooling your brow in a bitter haze of marbled smoke. Bulging Adam's apple lodged in your throat, cotton mouth. My charcoal lips blackening with loss, burning like fireflies. Cobalt Sonata. Blackening with loss, lips burn like fireflies. Mommy knocking feverishly on my bedroom door. Your friend's on the phone, she tries. She's crying. Nighttime shadows under cold ceiling of bottled stars, shivering indigo fingers, black and white fingernails, clutching hospital grade wool blankets, ice, air, fever dream, lanky brown silhouette towering over mental skyscrapers. A friend on the other side of the world's already gone. Cobalt blue windbreaker, strawberry scented hair. I wobble from my childhood bed to unlock the door, saved. Yes, I have an enormous water bottle. Dark stars. I wobble from my childhood bed, saved by a sad teenage pact between best friends. Those were days of passionate self-hate. Yes, we drew sonnets in pencil and heartache. Unrequited hurts much less, but I digress. Resting my head on his skinny shoulder, my eyes shut against the midnight morning, sitting on the Brooklyn Heights promenade, he shrugged, I rose, only because she'd phoned hours since I'd planted my exquisite corpse beneath my permafrosted childhood dome. Christmas lights flickered on and off while I swallowed mouthfuls of dark stars, letting go the stream of bodily excuses. Bloodletting. Letting go, the stream of bodily excuses telling me I need to go, this dancing in my pants, needing to piss in the toilet, but some, somebody's already using it to vomit. Let's have some fun. Crown of thorns, the body follows meekly when it's spiked with juices. Tenderly, we rock and swoon, motion hopefully akin to orbiting the moon. In my quiescence, no smooch or breach of confidence, only yeses and oh mys, the history of an evening's joys and this rolling Punch and Judy show, bloodletting only for sport, accidentally, proudly after he's gone. Okay, now for the interlude. which I cannot find. Give me a moment. <laughs> there it is. This one's called Raven. 
alabaster pose as she opens the door. She's doing her cocaine, but not too much. She might be working tonight. You see her brew a cup of coffee to restrain her habit. You know her nails are done. She makes you at home with her kindness. On the bathroom mirror, scrawled with wine red lipstick, your pleasure is our business. And everything went downhill since I started reading Shakespeare. She says she doesn't want to go. She's having too much fun. So she calls just to see, because maybe the John's already asleep in his hotel room. Phone wire wrapped around her finger. She's right. The John's passed out. She's calling it a night. Goodbye. Thank you. I have to water my plants. And the bridge, American Sign Language. More water. There's nothing about you I don't like. Candy, red, glistening fingers. Of course, you say. Now give up this. The waitress pours coffee for one. How we sat waiting for words. There's nothing about you I don't like. We had breakfast and pretended. Wherever we sat, the sun shone. Of course, you say, now give up this. Walking on the beach of my back, the softness turned to hunger, silence. There's nothing about you I don't like. Your face slips by me in the shower when I'm only being myself getting clean. Of course, you say, I'll give up this. At a dive bar in the East Village afterwards, signing the words, whistling, there's nothing about me you don't like. Of course, I say, now give this up. All right, enough for Baywatch Apollo. This one is called Song. Love me softly, sorry. Love me softly, softly. I can't talk, I'll start again. Love me softly, but none too well, sang the dark exhausted night, covered in rusty metal, ornate arabesques, scrappy aegis. So you place an ear to his breastplate, wondering where the heart lies under the armor. Mushy core, powerful beating on death's door. She waits for nobody, not even him. In his husk, the night forgets her sullen kiss, still frosty on his lips from a night before. Perhaps he has an understanding of it. That's maiden song. Nocturnes. There is no word for it besides, where would you stand before lightning strikes? Beside the streetlight, inside a cab, shivering, the rain's sharp strings sizzle from your skin. You laugh, so you fall from the permanent wind. Your shoes are untied, the bed is unmade, the sky turns violent. The entire city scrapes your feet encased in its glassy temper. Your, mus your musician's ear, like a stranger's nocturne, echoing. We are different beings for different things, he said, and the fire in his palms. We are different beings for different things, some given, some taken back, against gray skies leaden with irony. I'm gonna skip one and Moving with the narrative flow, this is, this is called the Trojan horse. Underneath blue sky, wrapped in cellophane, in the snowbird mountains, lost without a companion. Love is a tricycle, the Buddhist version of a triangle. Picture the rustle of yellow leaves backed by pink and red rock and a sky bluer than that. My friend on the other side 
whose tongue I've tasted in every vernacular, shuffles his eyes toward mine. A cat pounces on top of its prey, poised to play a little game. Let's be friends again, the, whis the wind whispers longingly. Altitude under my feet, hiking among Mormons, praying in the light of day. He tastes like you, red-eyed, sexy beard stubble, gorgeous. He has nothing to say of his fears. Only the skin we're in allows me to say. The light passes through the hallway. I dream of a sky marred by two ravens flying in unison. You, my friend, on the other side of the Atlantic, coasting on pride and quickness. You fly away, already rearranged. Your life assumes the change in season. We're gonna almost end. This is uh, a slightly sexier poem called Violin Sex. This poem is uh, part of a collection called HIV Here and Now. The gold medal around his neck, flex of his eyes, shards of goldenrod, Crayola smile, mirrored thing, so lovely, you tell me. Lines of cocaine as white as your eyes, envisioning the ecstasy of me, this room, this meeting of bone muscle skin, a performance you want to attend the sex so damn good you want it all over again. And when it's done, the perfect Cupid's bow of your lips gives me that expensive kiss. A gift so dazzling, but this time it's free. I would love to stay in bed with you all day, but I have places to go, people to see. And the laugh track surrounding us, whoever that is, when the fantasy is done, as he asks you to tango in a blindfold, this love, like Plato's triangle, never to behold the crueler measures of reality, inexact and slightly hypocritical, small lies of yesterday morning, when repeating the scene, you realize how he said, your hands touching me like a master handles his violin. And I have two more. This one is titled Friday the 13th. Has it ever happened to you that sudden inexplicable recoil from the precipice, what they call love sometimes, a pattern, a tapestry? You learn and you learn and you loosen your tongue towards a stranger whose own tastes as warm as apple pie. You both move on. Like a still photo in late afternoon rain, and you think that spring is the only time there is. And yet, so soon that summer come. Like a thief, he steals all your belongings. You are naked and free at the beach, eating egg sandwiches. And on the last, on the note of uh, egg sandwiches, this was um, my last poem, it's called Apocrypha. I'll take a sip of water first. One, definition, part of tradition, but unapproved by church fathers outside the norm or canon, yet understandable without proof things you can't really read, code, symbolic languages. Staving off the end, foot gold, crumbling winglessly into the sea, pilfering rings, each gem a dosage, living in cubes and collages, freeze dry, butterfly, winglessly into the sea. Two, magician, cutting in half, rakes the feet with plastic, 
silent retreat of black shoe spit, plastic grass, wink. Three, January. A bear starving inside my skin, danger in the field, stroking the neck of a cat, hope of a thaw, ice cracks like bones, shaggy calm, a hand at the window signs to someone already gone. Four, the long held theory. Five. Artemis in the carpool lane. I, 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 I. And six, communion. She, photograph. Stiff white dress, squint in sunlight. Bright stoop steps, I received. Pillow of my tongue, stolen afternoon. Count my bones, bruise afternoon. We are more beautiful than photographs, sweet whiteness on the tongue, and I am a woman singing. Thank you. Uh, you realize you're in big trouble now because your poetic reputation is gonna is gonna get out, and you're gonna be even more in demand. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Antonio, are you there? Yes, I, I yes, yeah. yes, I am. Um, should I go ahead? Yes, please. So, um, Tavi, I, I want to echo Eve and, and anticipate everyone else's words. Um, thank you for sharing exquisitely crafted poems. And um, I, as soon as I, I read uh, your crown, I, I jotted down. So I began to sing warbled blue notes meant for him to hear. I mean, it's it's a sheer joy reading that and 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 listening to the music of that and and, and other verses. So um thank you. And I I would love if if you walked us through um through the different strategies of of rewriting and and I remember in our conversations that you mentioned palimpsests. Um, I'm fascinated by two things of, uh, from your poetry, uh, and, and, but, but I don't wanna hog the conversation. Um, one of them is what for me, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, is the importance of wings, of bird-like imagery. Um, I, I found them everywhere and, 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 and in every iteration in striking ways. And then thinking about the crown, I went back to um, because, as you said, from another time, I immediately thought of John Donne's crown of sonnets. And, and then, as I kept reading your crown of sonnets, I, I was struck by what seemed to be a, a wonderful rewriting of, of consumption, of, of Christian, Christian imagery and, and Christian rituals of communion, uh, Eucharists, sacrifice. So if, if you could talk about some of that stuff, it, it would be great. But, but thank you. Um, primarily, thank you for, for again, a uh, wonderful collection of poetry. Thank you, Antonio. Uh, th th those are really interesting um, points. I really thank you for the, um, for the John Donne. I'll have to read some of his sonnets again. Um, he's, I think that's an interesting uh, intertext he also had a very passionate relationship. Um, of course, it would be sacrilegious to say that he had limerence for God, um, but uh, you, can, you can make that perverse argument. I, um, I would, I would <laughs> vouch definitely for that argument, but that's subject for another conversation. <laughs> yeah, it's it's so so the idea of of limerence is this passionate, uh, almost obsessive form of love that burns itself out, and I found uh, this sonnet would be a perfect form to express it. But of course, um, the obsessiveness can't be captured in one sonnet. So I felt that the crown would be the way that um, I could link all the episodes and aspects of that real experience uh, together um, with the imagery, as you say, that links some of the moments together. 
And I agree that there's something very Christian about these love sonnets and, um, and obviously with, you know, title like Eucharist. Um, and so, yeah, there's a certain uh, kind of sacred sacrilegious um, undertone to this passion. And um, I don't like to use the, the term passion necessarily because it invokes even more Christian imagery. Um, but there is a, a hell of a lot of uh, Christian sacrifice and suffering uh, in this in this collection. And I think it was one way that I was able to to work through uh, what you can really only describe as uh, romantic trauma. And um, I think I was largely successful in exercising it to continue with the Christian theme. Um, so yes, these are lyric poems, which as my um, my friend and colleague Dan Chasen uh, calls forms of nonfiction, and and so the question is how do you turn uh, how do you turn traumatic love into a work of art? Um, and I think you you just bring them together, and there's not really a way to um, bring the wings back, so to speak. Uh, there are only scars, um, and the scars are the kind of scars that are on the heart, not necessarily. Uh, metaphysical. So I do play with the physical and the metaphysical, I think, um, as symbol and also as literal. Um, so those are some of the thoughts that come to mind uh, with your very interesting uh, set of questions. I'll also take the, the question about revision. Um, as some of you know, um, I'm an obsessive reviser. And so these sonnets are different from the ones I sent you, for example, <laughs> uh, just yesterday or the day before. Um, and so I especially with the sonnets, it's such a perfecting form, um, perfectionist form. And although I don't follow the Anglo-Saxon rules, uh, I do try to follow some of the general rules, like the 10 syllable lines, um, the rhyme, which is not internal, but it's still, uh, and of course, uh, the interlocking uh, structure. But there's something about revision that to me feels um, like a form of not letting go. And so maybe I'm not ready to let go of some of these sonnets yet. Um, I don't know. I think a lot of times uh, as, a, as, a, as a gay man, I think uh, I have this little argument that uh, the way that uh, gay people and trans people reproduce is through art and culture. And so I think that I have somehow given birth to these, these poems and it's hard to let go of them. Like it is, it's hard to let go of um, your children when they grow up. So I think I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you. If, if anyone else has questions or, or comments, um, that would that would be it would be just put just put your hand up and we'll call on you. Um, English department, I see you all there. <laughs> oh, there we go. I knew I could. <laughs> Larry? Uh, uh, yeah, thank you, Tavi, that was great. Um, I, I, have, I have a general question about your poems and I have to explain the question in relation to how I experience them. Um, for, me, for me, they're sometimes sort of vividly concretely in focus, I can visualize, I can follow the syntax, the argument, and sometimes they're not, they feel more elusive, playful, they're transitioning faster than I can follow them. I like both what I can focus on and what I can't focus on, I should say, but it, the, having that experience makes me wonder to what extent you want your poems to be lucid, to what extent you want them to be difficult, what kind of mixture you want of those two experiences for your reader. Thanks, Larry. Yeah, it's a, it's a perennial question, how much to reveal and whether poetry is the vehicle for autobiography. And, and I, think those are, I think those are endless questions. And I think every poet has to answer them uh, you know, for themselves. Um, I think it depends. Sometimes poems can be mysteries that you want to unlock. But I also think 
for me, a lot of the poems that I write are more like music boxes and they just have a music and that's kind of what I'm going for is the experience, not the, not the significance or the meaning or the hermeneutics. Um, but some of them do tell a story. And so the question is, do I want the story to be um, legible, understandable? Um, and that's, again, that's an interesting question. I think for some poems, it matters a lot. Um, like I think that kind of sonnets tells a story for those of you paying attention. Um, and other poems like Apocrypha are purposefully surreal and they take a different tack. Um, but to sort of take a little, a, a step back for a moment, um, you know, I'm working on a memoir now that uh, I call an ekphrastic memoir. So for those of you uh, who <laughs> haven't heard that strange Greek, Greek term, it's a, it's, it's a form of writing, usually a poem that's based on a visual work of art. So I've started this memoir based on uh, photographs and, I, and so I guess to answer your question, I think narrative and prose are the best vehicles for that kind of revelation. And so that's where I'm turning. Um, but I also felt like the episodes and the experiences in these poems had to be poems um, for various reasons, uh, including the legacy of the sonnet as a vehicle for forms of love that include limerence and also include uh, religious love. Um, and so it doesn't matter to me so much if you get every single aspect of the narrative, because it's not really about that. I do believe that the poem is, a, is at least the sonnets in, the, in this form are lyric first and foremost. And so if you get the narrative, great, but it's really more about being in the, in the consciousness of the speaker and that you know, that is never a linear experience. It's always a fragmented uh, experience, just like it is for the, you know, for myself in trying to compose them, so. Thank you. <laughs> oh, we see a, uh, see a blue hand from Marilyn. I am here. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. No, I, just to follow up on Larry, oh, first of all, it is so great to see all these faces. I mean, if, there's so many great things to say about this reading and, but thanks to Eve and thanks to Tavi, it's just like, I just feel like I'm, kind of in the Newhouse Center, it's so great. Anyway, but just following up on what Larry was saying is, well, first of all, I did put in the chat and I hope you get the chat, is that uh, the Crown of Sonnets is really interesting. And I think a lot of sort of fairly contemporary poets use it, like Rita Dove, you know, at the end of Mother Love, which is just a wonderful, literally crown of that whole, you know, collection and, uh, and you know, and different for what you're doing, but not that different. But I, it was so pleasurable to hear it read out loud. And my follow up to Larry's question is also, I felt too, uh, and also, you know, the, the person is the, or the wonderful person, who, sorry, my, I can't remember because I'm gone. Uh, our, our opening person, it's like there is a just terrific verbal pleasure, but I felt like so many of these poems have to be actually looked at on the page you know and I, it's interesting that you're sort of moving towards this ekphrastic sort of more visual narrative thing but i felt like the, a lot of these poems needed the visual too that they really it you know i mean they i mean i always sort of struck about how much even when you silently read, you basically hear and rhythm and you hear sounds, you know, but you also have this way of being able to go back and forth and, and there's something so visual. So I, I I just really wanted to comment on that. I'm not sure I'm asking a real question, but it feels to me that a lot of these poems really need to be looked at on the, I mean, they can be appreciated in a reading, but so much of their complexity and almost architecture need to see and especially with the sonnet because you kind of almost have to see it architecturally on the page to see the end rhymes i mean even the old school end rhymes is that the whether it's petrarchan whether it's shakespearean whether it's not <laughs> any yeah. of those whether it's you know a 13 line thing so i just that's really interesting to me and i like I said, I'm not sure I asked a question, but I, oh, okay, so maybe I'll put a question together. <laughs> Would you think about the sort of looking at it on the page visually, 
God, my animals attack me every time I'm on Zoom. What um is that kind of linked to the acrostic in a way? I mean, I just made that I just popped it, that just popped into my head. But there's something visual about it that then you're kind of now visually moving to this more image kind of thing. Anyway, I'll shut up now. That's really that's really interesting, uh, Marilyn. Thank you. Um yeah, you know, there's a there's a few uh ticks in these um so for example mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm sure antonio see, uh, saw the those little so i i use um the hyphenation so some of the lines have to be hyphenated exactly exactly yeah 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 and i put the hyphen at the beginning of the next word as opposed to at the mm -hmm. end of the of the prefix and so there mm -hmm. are a lot of visual co uh, cues that you do miss um that i am doing so it is really working on all those linguistic levels, as well as not just the auditory, right? Um, so I do appreciate that. And that's also part of the obsessive nature of sonnets, <laughs> right? Um, you want to show the work, as it were. Um, and if you see these sonnets, are they, they, they tend to be uh, ragged. Um, so some of them, I, maybe, I can, maybe I can show something. Um, it's going to be difficult to show. Um, but I kind of do say sura, I cut lines, and and so there's a lot of visual visual uh, material that's being communicated. Um, like for example, bloodletting has a lot of dashes, a lot of dashes, right? So cutting the lines it, it themselves mm -hmm. uh, visually, and so I think there is a lot of orthographic and punctuation and all kinds of the tricks of the poetic trade um, that you do miss if you if you don't see the notation, right? Um, if you only hear the music. Um, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in both the page and the stage. Um, I'm not a spoken word poet, but I do think that there's something very magical about the voice. And, and I do try to imbue the voice when I read. Uh, but there is something also very, um, very technical and very rewarding um, about the page and about the complexity of the page. Um, so I, I appreciate both. Uh, I'm a total nerd, so I love things on you know to, to see them but also to see them on the page i think i love that stuff <laughs> nothing else could coin the genre ragged sonnet there you go <laughs> oh, i think oh emma oh do we have time it's okay if we don't yeah 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 no, okay absolutely all right well thank you so much um i was really excited to attend this because i have some familiarity with the term. I won't, I won't go into why, but if you Google, why am I obsessed with somebody? <laughs> the term that comes up and there's entire forums dedicated to, you know, overcoming it from a very like self-help psychological standpoint. Um, the one thing I was interested in is the, um, kind of the dark side of limerence that is really um, prevalent, at least in these sort of like contemporary, like lit clinical or or pseudo clinical literature, um, and a lot of people and uh, psychologists and stuff view it as something to be uh, um, actually opposed to love, like true love, and maybe this is just like the pathologization, pathologization of just like regular love that everyone experiences. And that's kind of annoying, but um, it does seem to be uh, associated with addiction. And I uh, was thinking about your references to cocaine use and drugs. Um, and I was wondering about, I guess, if that was, I think maybe the darker elements are a little more subtle and you're, maybe they're not subtle. Maybe they're just really obvious, but to everyone, but I was, I was just curious if there was, if that was intentional and like what your thoughts on that were. It, Cause it's not entirely a celebration of limerence, I think. Thank you, Emma. It's really nice to see you. Um, yeah, I, I am so thrilled to see all of you, actually. Uh, so thank you again for coming. Uh, it's so nice to see all uh, familiar faces. Um, and um, it is nice to you know, have us all together. So thank you, uh, Eve, for, for making this possible, and Lauren, too. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's the ambivalence, right, of, of, of this, for me, this collection, uh, not just the sonnets is uh, honoring and respecting an experience that was not altogether positive. Um, but you know, that is what experience is, right? Experience, if experience is, does not involve loss and pain, then it's not really knowledge. Um, and I think that's something that 
there is learning and growth that comes from, you know, having your heart broken, for example, to be like very trite. Um, but you're right, some of the some of the references in these poems are much, more, much starker, right? I always bring the edge, as one of my friends always says, Susan, hi, um, I always bring the edge. And I think I think my, you know, my life has brought a lot of edge, uh, and I brought a lot of edge to my life. Uh, and part of it, I think, has to do with youth, and also part of it has to do with being gay, being queer. Um, one thing that I that I always remember is that you know this kind of limerence is something that you that a lot of people experience when they are your age, uh, for example. And I was pretty much around your age when I had this this doomed love affair, as I call it. Um, but I think for a lot of queer queer folks, trans folks, um, ace folks, uh, we don't have the same access to those rites of passage. So for example, if you get your heart broken in high school, it could be ter you know, terrible and, and horrible. Uh, but if you get your heart broken um, you know, when you're in your 20s, it can be devastating in a different way. And, and I think in terms of queer desire and queer love, I think a lot of the time romance and sexuality are cognates to other kinds of love that may not be uh, as available because of being queer or trans or, or othered in some other way, right? And so there's a, there's a lot of, uh, it's, it's a learning curve in a sense. And so I think these experiences, to speak personally, these experiences were a form of sentimental education. And obviously I would, I would hope not to have to go through that much to learn, um, but sometimes that is, that is the path. Um, and again, I think you can make a lot of beauty out of that experience if you have the fortitude, uh, <laughs> the stomach for it. <laughs> so I think I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Tavi, I just, I just had one, uh, I don't know if it's really a question, but it sort of builds on what Larry's, what Larry said about some of the poems, you, you know, you, you, they're elusive. I, I, I thought what was so brilliant about them was that mixture of kind of everydayness with these highly allegorical images such as the, the broken wings of, of Icarus. But, but I also thought that, the, that there was a dialogic quality to them so that you hear the voice of the person you're obsessed with as well as your voice. And so to me, they transcended a kind of narrow autobiographical um, framework and and uh, you know I began to see this as an exchange that's occurring within a city where all kinds of other exchanges are occurring at the same time. So I was just wondering, um, you know, if we think of this as almost a coming of age collection, could you say something about the city, the St. Mark's Place, and the uh, all those other cityscapes that you're so beautifully evoking? Thank you, Eve. Um, that's really great. I love that idea. And I think uh, that is partly what's happening. I, I wanted to be really specific about place. Um, so there is, you know, St. Mark's, there's, um, you know, the Brooklyn Heights uh, promenade. There's a lot of these, uh, you know, moments and places that are from a New York that I grew up in that doesn't quite exist in the same way. Mm -hmm. So part of it is that kind of nostalgia for, you know, the New York of the 90s that was gritty and edgy and um, also kind of histrionic in terms of the, the, the energy, especially the youthful energy. Uh, I mentioned the East Village. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was quite the time um, to be alive there and to be experiencing the city in that, in, that, in that moment on the cusp of it, you know, coming out of the doldrums of recession um, in the 80s and before the big, you know, the big blowing up into the dot com and then the island of billionaires, right? This is before. It's also where you had a lot more of, of, of a link to place um, for people in general. This is this is right before the the explosion of digital, right? And so places were essential, right? Um, if you'll notice that the Raven poem, she has a her finger wrapped around the telephone wire. That's quite a dated reference, right? Um, but that's what it was. It's a, it's a very analog city and, and, and all those pleasures of the analog, right? Uh, the dive bar, um, the going to see people, the calling people, um, the being on hold, um, the being there. Yeah. In some ways, we don't have the same connection in terms of a lot of communities. And obviously, I'm saying this 
on Zoom. So this is like a, a really exacerbated version of what of of what we have somewhat lost. Um, and so, yeah, I really do appreciate that. And I think in the memoir, I hope to be to even to give even more of a sense of place. Um, and, yeah, thank you. Um, anyone, anyone else, in particular, students uh, of poetry who want to say something, or Antonio, you want to give the last word, or Tavi, you want to give the last word since you we're talking about your poetry? Oh wait, we have. Is it Rochelle? It is. <laughs> Rochelle. Hi. How are you? Um, good. I, I, I would not call myself a student of poetry. <laughs> I am more a student of like television and um, TV. And so my comment kind of has to do with that and that just like, I think this is the first time I've ever heard of collection of poems where I just was kind of like in a film the whole entire time. Um, and it was just kind of like, like, yeah, I just felt like I was watching like very dramatic, intense, visceral television. And it was great, which is why I had to have my camera off most of the time because I was making too many faces and I didn't want to. Um, but yeah, like I, it, it was, it was just such a wonderful experience, and in, in 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 experiencing words that like put me somewhere, and like I was seeing in front of my eyes, like as it was happening, was very new but very great. And so I just wanted to share that. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah, um, it's given me. Uh, I'm I'm inspired by this by this reading. Um, sometimes I I kind of despair about the state of poetry or <laughs> the the audience for poetry and. That's partly why I think turning to prose, um, turning to prose that's poetic, that's more narrative um, is so appealing. But I think there is something about the poetic uh, that does kind of transport you in a way um, that no other form can. So we'll see where my poetry goes, but I'm very proud of this moment. Um, and I thank you all for sharing it with me. So, if I can just, it's, we're almost at five o'clock. I, I just want to again express our thanks, I think as members of our, of our audience, and I'm including the students who just asked wonderful questions. Students are graduates, I'm not sure which you are, but, uh, <laughs> um, uh, you know, Tommy, this gives me hope for poetry and poetry at Wellesley, and, and I think You've just started something that we need to continue. And I, I thank you so much um, on behalf of everyone here today, but uh, just on, on keeping our spirits going in this, in this difficult time that we've had. So, whew, thank you. Thank that's, you that's so much. Appreciated. Yeah. Thank you guys.